The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. That is a quote from Albert Einstein in William Miller's memoir of Einstein in Life magazine, as they and William's son discuss one's reason and purpose in life. Today we have the opportunity to learn from someone who I look up to and aspire to be like someday. Morton Schenk has spoken at conferences such as DEF CON, Black Hat, among many others, and he is a major driving force behind much of the great content and courses offered by Offensive Security. He is a shining example that we must all be relentless in our never-ending pursuit of knowledge. Welcome, Morton. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Very honored that, uh, that you were able to, to do this with me. Um, you know, the first question that I am super curious to get your input on, um, how important are memes in cybersecurity? <laughs> uh yeah, I think I think that that is very important. Uh, but but to be completely honest, I don't think my meme game is very good. I I, I do I do struggle there. I'm not so sure. You know, you had the uh, Velociraptor meme in um, in your DefCon talk. You're quite good with the memes, especially on the on the presentations. Um... To be honest, I think getting the memes correct from my my talks is actually harder than producing the content doing the research. Well, um, but likely e equally important. Yeah, I I can I I can relate a little bit. You know, when uh, whenever you're talking on Discord, everyone's kind of memeing these days. You know, they'll, they'll all start spamming like the eyeball emojis. <laughs> yeah, and that's how I know when something cool is going down. So yes, very very happy and honored for for you to share a little bit of your experiences and you know, maybe hopefully glean off some of your knowledge today. So um, for those that may not have heard of you, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Morten Schink. Um, I currently work for Offensive Security as a content developer. Uh, that kind of boils down to actually doing the research and writing the content and building the labs, or these parts of them, uh, for the courses Offensive Security uh, provide. Um, so that includes the, the PWK and the uh, with the OSCP exam and also the uh, new courses such as the Pen 300 and the uh, the upcoming EXP 301. Um, besides that, as you mentioned, I've done some some prior talks at Black Hat DEF CON and a few other places, um, mostly regarding exploit development, which is is one of my my personal interests. Um, yeah. That's, that's probably about me. If you were to go back in time, um, what would you say sparked your interest in cybersecurity? Yeah, so I think the, the if you will, the defining moment, if you want to call it that, was actually, uh, that, that is some time ago now, that's about 15 years ago, I guess, a, a bit less than 15 years. Uh, I was in a, uh, a presentation or a meeting of whatever you want to call it, uh, where a, um, a, a coworker uh, did a presentation on essentially what hacking is. Uh, and I found that to sound really cool. So I started looking into it and, and reached out to that person. Uh, and he essentially became my uh, mentor to start with. Um, and it helped me the first couple of years to actually to to, to show me the way and stuff. And he actually pointed me towards uh, offensive security and the uh, the uh, pen testing with Backtrack, as it was called back then, uh, which I then uh, signed up for back in 2011. Um, so that, that was kind of my, my introduction. As soon as I started that course, I was honestly hooked. Uh, never, never looked back since then. That's awesome. And, you know, I originally signed up for um, PWB as well. Um, that was back in 2012. I think we had started around the, the same time. Um, what, uh, what was your experience from that course now that you're able to look at it, you know, in retro retrospect? Do you, do you think um, there was some challenges that could have 
you know been better addressed or do you do you feel that the the course has kind of naturally evolved with the industry so um to me P pwb back then was uh, an eye opener uh, but honestly i like the format it was in uh, it was to, to to put it into context because this is like 10 years ago so i'm assuming at least some some younger viewers may never heard about it and don't recall those times essentially but keep in mind that there was no YouTube, there was no videos, there was no hack the box, there was no try hack me, there was nothing. Like almost no competition, no labs you could just sign up for and do. Um, there was no GitHub. You, you couldn't just find code everywhere. ExploitDB was very new. Uh, they they essentially, P2B, P2B was originally written with Milgram. And then when Milgram was closed down, uh, offensive security took over uh, essentially that, that role uh, and created exploit DB uh, to house many of the same exploits and build it from there. So the, the resources were very far between. Um, so when people sometimes complain that, that PWK don't have enough handholding and you need to do research on your own, um, I, it's, to me that, that is, that is it, it's strange to hear because yes, it is correct, you do. Uh, but honestly, compared to 10 years ago, it is so much easier today because you can almost just Google something and get a YouTube video to show you what to do and, and teach you. That, that is obviously both bad and good. Uh, but, but back when I did it, it was you really had to do a lot of it yourself. A lot of, lot of the stuff didn't actually have answers online. You didn't really have to, to dig into it yourself. Um, so I, I, honestly, I think that the product of PWK is better now than it was back then. Uh, but because it, it's been reworked multiple times back then, obviously there was, this was one of the first iterations of it. So as with everything, it improves over time. Uh, but for, for that time, it, it was really great. And I think what caught me most about P, P, PWB wasn't only the, the, the concept of the hacking, but also about the mentality, the, the try harder mentality. Uh, th that really caught me, um, and, and essentially something I, I've been having since then. Realistic, I had before as well, just not applied to this field. Yes, and that's very relatable for me. I I remember those days, and I remember um, you know, millworm is a word that I have not heard in a long, long time. I feel like Obi Wan Kenobi right now, but um, I, I remember when millworm had gone down. And there, you're right. There, there were not the same amount of resources back then that there are now and it was in, in that in its own right it, it made that much much more challenging than than it was when i took the exam you know a couple of years ago but i i, I feel like it's really evolved in a in a great direction i think you know people like you and others at offensive security have really really done that course justice if um if you were to say from high school going to your role at offensive security now what what was your career path like from then to now well in one way i want to say it's special but in the other way i think this that's actually kind of common in infosec that most people have uncommon uh, career trajectories and paths um not that many take a cyber security a degree in college and then go into pen testing and that's it right most people have some strange roundabout way of getting there which honestly is what teaches them both the mentality and the mindset but also a lot of the skills uh, so, so in that regard my story is not unique in any way but but it, obviously it's sometimes it's interesting to hear these strange stories and, and yes my, mine is a very roundabout way and um, i started right out of high school uh, went to college uh, studied uh, as a physics major uh, after I got that degree, honestly, I was very tired of school because so much theory, not enough practice. Um, so I actually joined the military, um, which I enjoyed. That was a completely different thing. Uh, I, I joined as a, as a just regular army grunt, um, but uh, made my way to, to the officer's academy and graduated the officer's academy and, and um, served six years as an officer. Um, as part of my, my officer's time, you will, uh, I got back into the more technical part uh, that kind of resurfaced. So uh, at some point, this is the, 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 the prior colleague I talked about earlier, who, the guy who actually became a mentor, was a fellow officer. Um, and 
he, he got me into to the entire uh, hacking scene and then from there I, I landed a few positions inside the military first as um, system design system management but then into security um, I had a tour to Afghanistan as head of the uh, the both both the IT but IT security as well, which was fairly interesting, uh, to say the least. And then from there, I ended up in as a SOC manager for a bit over two years, um, which was fun. It, it was my first real gig in security, but I, I honestly I prefer the um, <laughs> the offensive side as, over the the defensive side as many do. I don't disregard the challenges at all, uh, but some of the, the circumstances around uh, blue teaming did not really appeal to me. Um, so from there, I moved into the uh, the intelligence services uh, and worked uh, on the offensive side. Uh, after a stint there, I went into the, uh, the private sector as a, as a consultant, uh, a pen testing consultant, and then uh, after that, I, I got hired at, at um, offensive security. Very cool, and um, you know, in in its own way, um, kind of a, you know, I never went to university for you know physics or anything like that, but you know, in in my own way, like a very similar journey um, between you and I. Um, in in your opinion, do you? Do you feel that it's um, you know, desirable for you know people working in our field to have kind of like a well-rounded, um, you know, blue team, little bit of background experience? Or uh, do you feel that people can, you know, if if they're knowledgeable enough and skilled enough, they can just come into the field um, from from college or from whatever circumstance they find themselves in? What's what's your thoughts on that? So I think that there are different different perspectives on this, obviously, but. In my opinion, the, the biggest help to become a, a good at the offensive side is honestly to know about the defensive side. And not only the defense, the defensive side, but also about IT in general. Uh, sysadmin work. A, the, the, a, a person who has worked five years as a sysadmin on AD and actually learns how to be a pen tester on AD is probably going to be a lot better than a person who just comes out of college and picks up pen testing because he knows all the issues, all the problems people make. Obviously, there's a mindset thing here that can be sometimes, sometimes it can be hard to switch from a sysadmin mindset to an offensive mindset. Uh, but for people who, who achieve that, they, they become awesome pen testers because they know all the mistakes and know exactly what to look for. Um, and, and that is some of the challenges when you go directly from, from college or directly from a non-related field into pen testing. Is you learn a lot of techniques, but you don't necessarily know why they work. You just know that they do work. But until they don't, then you don't necessarily know why they should have worked and they don't. So how do you modify it, all that kind of stuff? That that is, to to me that that is the 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 value having a, a defensive side first or a a, a sysadmin side first before you go to the defensive side. That helps you a lot. And you don't have to be a sysadmin for ten years to know this. Like having two years or a year or whatever in, in sysadmin side um, and essentially seeing how organizations do stuff and especially how they don't do stuff. Um, and do it wrong that helps tremendously when you start picking up the offensive side i totally agree and i'm you know kind of thankful that i had a little bit of um blue team experience prior to going into red teaming because if i had never worked on a blue team i, I wouldn't understand at least uh, like in a contextual sense you know how a sock operates you know things that i as an attacker would need to be aware of going into an environment and you're know, trying to go about evading, you know, being detected. And uh, I think that builds up onto the, the next question. Um, what do you think are some misconceptions people have about um, penetration testing versus red teaming? Because, you know, a, a newcomer might, might say, oh, well, I don't know what that red teaming thing is. Um, you know, maybe I'm more interested in pen testing or, you know, maybe they think, oh, well, I've heard of red teaming. You know, it sounds like you do hacking kind of stuff. Um, what do you think are some misconceptions that people have? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm going to be the old guy now uh, because I do remember when this all started. Um, back when I did BWB and I started getting to the defensive side, um, it, it was called a penetration test or a pen test. That was it. There were no other really terms for it. That, that was simply it. 
Um, then that scene kind of grew and grew, and more and more companies were offering it. Uh, and then as everything, as with everything, uh, sales departments getting into it, and you need to differentiate your products. So the term kind of seemed to get stale, just calling it a pen test, because how do you differentiate one pen test better than another? Because there are no official uh, metrics to track this at all. Um, to be honest, if you did a, 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 a vulnerability scan with Nessus and hand off a report, you could claim that to be a pen test. And in principle, no one could argue against that because there is no definition of this. Most pen testers would disagree, but there's no clear definition here. So a lot of people who, who did actual pen tests, not just vulnerability scans, they started rebranding a pen test as a red team test. Um, because that term kind of came from the uh, the military, but you had the red team, you had blue team, red team, there was a concept where you do not only in infosec, but in general, that you, you talk about the red team, blue team, that you do uh, opposition against each other and drill it out, figure out what to do. Um, so that term kind of came in there. Um, and, and that again, that grew and that grew. So everyone did red teamings. All of a sudden, red teaming was common. Now it can, can start to become uh, adversary simulation. So there are multiple different terms. None of them have any clear definitions. So essentially, whatever I say they are, that's what it is for me. Whatever someone else says it is for him, that is how it is for him. So this is this is difficult because how, how do you differentiate, differentiate between a red team test and a pen test? You can't really because it depends on what that person is talking about. Um, I have my opinion and that's, and that's Obviously, it's an opinion we also have at Offset because I, I really did influence that a lot, especially with the Pen 300 course. Uh, and we are in agreement uh, in, in the content development uh, department that what we call a pen test is a pen test as you knew it. What we call a red team test does not have anything specifically to do with Active Directory, doesn't have anything specific to do to an internal test. That's all a pen test. A pen test can be against a web app. Often that time, that would be called a web app pen test. You could do it against an uh, external phishing campaign. That's often an external pen test. You could do a assume breach. So that's an internal pen test. That's also a pen test. It doesn't really matter what you attack. It's still a pen test. To me, where it becomes a red team is if there's a blue team involved. Because doing a red teaming test, at least for me and for Offset, implies there's a blue team looking at you. Whether that be a SOC or something else, doesn't have to be 24-7, but there have to be actually some people looking for you. Um, if not uh, real-time, at least near real-time in some sort of logging. To me, that's a big difference. To do red teaming, in my opinion, you have to be able to be a pen tester already. You have to know how to do the attacks. Then the next step comes in a red team test is how do you hide those tracks? How do you avoid detection? What about evading logs, evading detection, all that kind of stuff? Not just evading an AV like we do in pen 300, but actually evading the logs <clears throat> being, being detected. And there's um, there's a crazy amount of depth. So like both on the defensive side, right? You've got that defense in depth sort of posture. But you know, in I remember from my military days, you know, when we were doing base exercises, there's when um, you know, what we called op four, you know, many other organizations would call them red teams. Um, it, they have their own form of defense in, in depth. You know, they they have you know, so many like different levels of nuance in how they go about you know assessing what the base is going to be doing, and um, even beyond that, like there's there's just a a, a whole layer upon layer of, of different methodologies that go into it. And I, I think I, I'm in agreement with you on how you differentiate penetration testing versus red teaming. I think it's important for there to be some sort of context to it where, you know, there, there's a active search for the adversaries and there's, there's a need for, for us to be able to navigate around those. So I think it's also important to mention here that <clears throat> Very, very few people who work on the offensive side do red teaming tests, actual red teaming tests. The majority, I would say 95% or something like this, is a pen test, no matter what you call it. Because there is not no one actually tracking, right? You're, you're trying to test the security of the application, of the system, of the network. You're trying to figure out whether the, whether the, the defensive side can catch you and, and find you. 
that's not the, the purpose of the test. If that's not the purpose, then it's a pen test, which also means the, the entire notion of, oh, well, PowerShell is, is so old school, we should use uh, C-sharp because it doesn't get detected. PowerShell has so much logging, you easily get caught. Well, if no one's looking for you, what, what does it matter, right? If no one's looking, reading all those logs specifically to cache you within those four days of engagement, it doesn't really matter that there's logs. If you do a red team test, then yes, it matters a lot. But that's a big differentiating. And, and when you learn stuff, like when you start learning AD uh, attacks, well, it doesn't make any sense to try and learn both how to attack it while also trying to evade any kind of logging. Because then you're just complicating for yourself. Do one step at a time. Try to learn how the attack works to understand the attack. Because then you also know how to do attack in different ways. So you can actually try and evade being detected. Um, instead of just following a playbook and saying, this is how we do it, and that's it. You should really learn it in depth instead, if you want to go be a red teamer. Totally agree. And you know, kind of spinning this back onto you know, previous experiences, having gone through penetration testing with Backtrack and um, you know, kind of tying this in with how there was you know, not as many resources available back then and how this conversation has kind of evolved in the industry between penetration testing and red teaming. You know, there's much, much more resources available today for people that want to understand you know, the differences between the two and the skills to be able to work in those fields. But you know, back 10, 15 years ago, you know, I'm curious what resources were important for you and what helped like what resources helped you um learn and grow within your field so uh so, so there's some three things to note here obviously first of all when back in, in pwb there was nothing like ad right ad was not mentioned at all so that was not even a field you, you i started searching for resources in at that time um the majority of stuff uh, from there was essentially web app stuff. Um, and many things you could Google, but well, you could try Google stuff. And there was especially the, the pen test monkey, uh, which had all the SQL injection syntax, which is like, again, this is the site that's more than 10 years old and, and it's still valid today. That, that was a very valuable resource. But the way that would work was you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get a, a, a a video showing how to use that syntax. No, you would get the syntax, then you have to work out how to use that syntax, which obviously required a lot of time involvement. Uh, so that, that's a big difference from, from today. You can go and try Hack Me Room, you can see exactly what is done step by step, and getting handholded through it all, compared to what we did what we did back then. Essentially, you were given the, the, the five piece, pieces of the puzzle that requires 20 puzzles pieces, and then you had to figure out where do they go and also create the other 15 pieces of the puzzle. Um, to me, that has helped a lot in, in, in engagements afterwards because I would know this is possible, likely. I just have to work out how compared to I have, I have to have done this before in a lab before I can do it. But those are two differences to me, at least. Many pen says I, I've done stuff simply because I know theoretically this should be possible. So now I have to work out how. Uh, plus, I have to work out how fast because I have to do this with a four-day engagement. So I can't take up more than half a day on this because I have to do all the stuff in the engagement as well. Um, so that thinking on your feet and going going with it and developing stuff uh, on the flow, that, that's an important skill to me and as, as a pen tester. Um, and it's not necessarily something you get just by following walkthroughs all the time. You need to set up a project and do stuff yourself with minimal resources to actually learn how to do it. That, that's one thing. So when you talk asked about resources, I think one of the things that was a lack of resources, which actually helped. Um, so that, that started the web app side for the, the, the export development side, which became my personal uh, favorite. Um, th there's no doubt that the Corland tutorials, which also he still has up 10 years later, uh, they're awesome. They're really great. Uh, they, they were awesome resource back then. They're still awesome resource to learn from today. And um, so far, no one has actually put out a free content that honestly, that's better. At least that's more fulfilling. Uh, content you find today is much more automated. Uh, 
require essentially you run a tool, this tool gives you a solution, you have to fix one thing and then it works. And that's great, except you have no idea what's actually happening, what you really doing. You don't know it, know it in depth. And this kind of goes back to the same thing. You have to know how this details really work to build a strong foundation before you go for more advanced stuff. Um, so I think those were probably some of the two most resources I've used and looked at. But again, the, the biggest part for me was just doing it over and over and over. Um, as a personal story here, when I learned how to do uh, learn the ROP technique, that was from the core and tutorials. Uh, but at the time, I had a, uh, a two-hour commute to work uh, both ways on the train. So I had two hours from uh, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. And then from 4 a.m. to 6, uh, sorry, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. every day on a train. So either I could just nap or read a book, but instead I sat there for almost six months and wrote rock chains on my laptop. That was a lot of hours just writing rock chains, and that taught me exactly how they work. Obviously, I followed the, the tutorial first, but then I picked up other applications, just tried it out, and, and sat there for hours and hours getting frustrated, but getting it working at the end. Um, so to me, the most important resource you can have is your own commitment to something, uh, which again, to me, translates into the try harder mentality, uh, which very often is misunderstood, sadly, that it's a meme, it's, it's, it's a troll, but to me, it's not. To me, try harder essentially means you have to try it out. You have to keep uh, perseverance. You have to keep persistence. If you just quit at the first sign of, of, of trouble, in my opinion, you're not going to make it in InfoSec. You're probably not going to make it in many other industries either, because if you give up the first sign of trouble, you're not going to learn. You're not going to get any better. It has literally become a matter of life or death for me. Um, it, like, I, I don't even, I don't even want to like begin to get into that. But I mean, it, it's true. Like, there's much, much more to the the try harder mentality, and it, it's you know, very deep and it goes very personal for me. And, uh, like, I don't really know of a better way to describe that mentality. You know, you like, I'm trying to imagine being a person on that train, you know, sitting next to Morton looking over, like, what is this guy doing? You know, doing something weird and I don't understand it. And then lo and behold, you're working on rock chains on your way to and from work. That's, that's insane. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Um, you know, I, I've found a lot of success in, you know, setting up my own labs. Um, but, you know, as resources became more available, I kind of shifted, you know, kind of like 50-50 between setting up my own labs and, you know, doing all of these, um, like, kind of prepackaged, uh, pre-set up resources. Um, do you feel like uh, there's maybe some missed opportunities there? Or do you feel that... Um, it's kind of on, on the student to, to figure it out for themselves. I think there is, there is some, as you said, missed opportunities here. The, the, it kind of goes back to where we started uh, about a good sysadmin becomes a very good pen test because he knows how it's all set up. He knows how it works. He knows what you did wrong. If you just go into a pre-configured network and, and own that, that's it. Well, Sure, you trust the, the person who built it that the misconfigs in that or the vulnerabilities are like actual stuff you would find. But you don't actually know. You don't know why it's set up like that. Why would something why would someone do stupid things like this? That makes no sense, right? But if you did your own home network and, and you set something up and something isn't working and you have to solve that problem, well, as you simply see, well, I just run this with admin privs or domain privs and domain admin privs. It works now, great. Well, I need, I need to revert that back to other... I'll, I'll do that later, right? I'll figure out the permissions later. And then all of a sudden, it's still running domain admin. That is how it works in, in a corporate environment as well. Like, you, you get you buy a product, you have to get it working, and the manual says you need domain admin. Well, like, that, that can't be true. You call up the, the, uh, the customer, uh, the, the, the representative, and he's like, well, sure, that's what we need. Well, sure, then we'll set up as domain admin. We'll figure this out later because we have a deadline of getting this product in production, right? Five years later, that person even isn't, isn't even working there anymore, and, and everyone, no one knows why this is running domain admin. It just is, and no one dares touch it, right? But that's very common. Uh, and if either you haven't worked on on, on a sysadmin or build your own home network, a home network, 
you miss a lot of this stuff. Um, obviously, it's a trade-off uh, because building everything yourself can be very time-consuming and isn't necessarily the best part, but it should be part of it. Just going and, and tagging AD someone else built is awesome and it can help you because you get more variance. But at some point, you should build a home network on some sort uh, where you actually try to set everything up so you know how it works. Um, another thing, and this is, this is a lot of... When we launched launched 10300, I did a, a bunch of, of, of help uh, on our Rocket Chat and also in this Discord uh, for various students. And a lot of the times, uh, the, the problems result around enumeration. Uh, that was, as, as we also know for PWK, that is typically the biggest problem, finding the attack vectors. Um, and what I saw is ma many students, essentially, they get access to a box, they dump the hashes, they run crap mac exec against everything to see whether something sticks. And every time I was like, well, no, why did you do that? Well, that's easy. Yeah, sure. But like, why? Why would you run crap mac exec against a network of 10,000 machines to see one hash matches, right? No, you do, you do actual enumeration, but to do that, you know, need to know how it works, uh, which means you have to know how does a sysadmin actually configure an AD to understand like something like PowerView, how does PowerView actually work? Well, that is based on how sysadmins actually configure stuff. And sysadmins base stuff on how Microsoft recommend as practices you do. So if you understand the best practice by Microsoft, and honestly, I've, I've taken the, the I'm not sure whether these certifications actually exist anymore, but the, the base AD, the, back when I did it, back in 2014, I think it was, um, Microsoft had a set of three courses to, to make, make, like make this foundational education for a uh, app, sysadmin on, on AD. If you wanted a sysadmin job, uh, you should take these, these three certifications. I actually took those just to learn how, like, how does Microsoft actually tell sysadmins to do stuff? Uh, because then that's what you're going to see. Well, you're not going to see better than that. That's for sure. You're going to see worse than that, probably. But you're going to see stuff like that. That helped me immensely to understand how, how everything works. Uh, again, you don't necessarily have to take the courses. But then you should look up resources on saying, how, how is this done? Not just how to attack one piece, but how does all this tie together? Um, so, so for me, teaching and learning is very much about getting a broad and deep understanding, not just one specific topic. Because then you're missing context. And that missing context will, will not allow you to expand on a technique or, or learn more advanced stuff that goes outside the bounds of that technique. And speaking of more advanced stuff, you know, I, I know you had said that exploit development was an aspect of this field that you very greatly admire. Um, mm -hmm. how, how, did you, how did you get involved in that? What, what drew you to exploit development? Because... There's a lot of other fields within penetration testing that you know are are also exciting. Exploit development is not an easy one by any means. No. Well, yes and no. To to me, it, it's it's. I think it's 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 personal. First of all, uh, how you learn, how you understand stuff. Um, honestly, to me, the hardest field I've encountered is web app pen testing. That is to me the hardest part. It's the most that comes the least natural to me. I've done a bunch of, of web app pen tests. Uh, I've done, done taken multiple different web app courses. So I wouldn't say I'm bad at it, but it does come natural to me. Uh, something I, like expert development just comes natural to me. Uh, I, I find it very natural. I find it very fun. Uh, so that's, that's obviously what drew, it in, drew me into it. I found it very fun to toy with these very low level um, things. Also because you're, you're, you're really picking apart stuff you're not supposed to pick apart. And you have to figure out how does this actually work. Uh, to me, it is sort of like physics. That you, you look for the building block, right? You look for the very small building blocks, the rule to tie them together. It's sort of the same thing. Um, so th that, that's what I love about it. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's, it's difficult. I think it's the, the main problem with, with expert development is there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, Active Directory, you don't necessarily need to know how NT 4.0 Exit directory worked because honestly, that's almost the same way as it works today. You have a few more techniques, but it's not that many more. The, the concepts are majority the same. How exploit development worked on XP and how a very advanced uh, browser exploit works today, that's two completely different things. 
while learning a, an advanced browser exploit today, like we teach uh, in AWE, like there's no way. You cannot start there. You have to start the basics. So that, that thing, that's probably the most challenging part about exploit development is there are really no shortcuts here because you want to understand the very uh, cutting edge stuff. You need to know the basics because oftentimes the basics come back in some form, in some facet of it. Um, especially if you're doing research, you need to know all these basics because like, if you don't know them, all of a sudden you might hit an attack vector. You think this is not possible, but if you knew your basics, you would know, well, this, this kind of looks like something or I could reuse this old technique in a new way. Um, so th that is definitely something I think is the biggest challenge that you have to go all the way back. I'm not saying you have to start at XP, but you, you can do essentially all the same stuff on, on Windows 10 with old apps, but you have to start with the old apps. You can't just boot off Chrome and then start hacking. That's, that's, that's going to be a very bad experience, and you're going to miss out context. You could probably follow a tutorial to learn a Chrome exploit, but that wouldn't mean you can go and develop your own exploits then. You would be missing a lot of context. For, um, for younger penetration testers and red teamers wanting to develop more advanced skill sets like that, and you know maybe maybe not just in exploit development, but in other areas as well, um, what do you think are some kind of foundational topics that are important for them to, to learn and explore if they wanted to become more advanced in their craft? I think uh, in, in today's environment, especially if you talk about work opportunities, um, if you start out as a junior pen tester, I don't think there's any doubt the most two most common uh, work areas is web app and AD, because that's the most prevalent. That, that's for sure. It, it's, it's probably going to be 80% of the work you'll do. Uh, where work, web app is probably even the biggest one. Um, so those two areas are definitely something I think are important to understand. Um, and as part of that, you need to understand how, how they're built, right? For AD, you should need to know how a sysadmin does stuff. For web app, you don't, I'm not saying you have to be a web admin uh, programmer, web app programmer, but you should, know, you should have some basic ideas on how is an app actually coded. And what kind of mistakes might you make? Um, and you should also have some programming skills. Again, you, you don't have to be able to code a fully fledged app because that takes years for a team of developers. But you should try and make some some pox to see how does this actually work. And what is what is difficult, what is not difficult? Because stuff that's difficult is probably where they took shortcuts. And if it took a shortcut, that's probably where you find a vulnerability. Um, so th that is definitely something that's worth working on as well. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't matter whether you do .NET, you do PHP, you do some other language. The important part is you, you pick one language and you stick with that for your project. And you become at least somewhat proficient with that. Because if you become proficient with one language and you understand the fallacies using that language and the entire concept, then it's very much easier to translate to other languages, other concepts. Um, Honestly, I, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not a programmer. I've taken courses uh, in, in college to try and learn stuff about programming. But honestly, the, the programming language I learned as the very first programming language was actually uh, basic. Um, on a, a Commodore 64, I, I, I coded up a basic that in my high school years turned into the, the pocket calculator, the Texas calculator, which actually had a basic embedded in it essentially probably wasn't really basic, but it was the same language, essentially. So I, I would actually, like, in, in chemistry class, you would have to draw these, like, curves on, on pH values and stuff like that. Honestly, I found that very boring. So actually, I programmed apps in my calculator to do this automatically. Uh, obviously, that was kind of a bad idea because you couldn't actually print that anywhere, so I couldn't actually hand that as a result anywhere, so I had to do it by hand anyway. But... I did that, so I kind of started learning programming. And then when I went to college, I learned uh, C and C++. Um, that's more or less the only languages I've, I've really learned. Going from there, it's easy to pick up another language. As soon as you don't know something in depth, it's very easy to lo learn another language. Um, so, so saying you need to learn 30 languages is not true. You need to learn one language. Then you can apply the lesson from that language on 29 other languages, which means you can read and you can Google and, and put something apart together very easily. That, that, that's, that's my lesson, at least on this part, I've learned. I'm going to like preface this with I'm definitely not a, a programmer either, at least definitely not like 
a professional one. I'm I'm very much a novice hobbyist programmer at best. But um I I, I agree with you, you know, like even just learning you know the the basics of one language um i started off with visual basic I don't, i'm not sure if you remember that hot garbage mm-hmm. um, yep. i skipped that to be honest <laughs> that's what i started with but um you know i kind of took some of the some of the concepts from those days and you know learning python was really easy for me like it, it was almost a no-brainer and you know even beyond that looking at you know different scenarios that i come across in work i mean you know, picking up a little bit of JavaScript, not a not a problem because I already have a little bit of that foundation. And yeah. it's kind of sad that there's a little bit of um, like a hot debate these days about, you know, you. some people will say, well, you should learn a little bit of programming, but you don't necessarily need to know a, a lot of programming. Um, I'm I'm kind of conflicted on that one. Well, so I, I think the, to me, the, the poor, especially when you talk about the, the offensive side, but honestly, it applies to the decent defensive side as well. Uh, if you work a sock or something like that, um, you need to understand many languages because oftentimes you don't pick the language, right? If you're doing a web app pen test, you don't pick the language because that the customer picked the app for you. So you need to know that language or you know, need to know the fallacies that can, can apply to that language in the app that results in vulnerabilities. Or if you work in a web app, uh, sorry, in a SOC, and, and you, 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 get, you, you find something in the logs that, that could look like an attack or some kind of exploit, well, you don't pick the language that exploit was written in. That's the attacker who picked that. So you actually need to understand these languages. It doesn't mean you need to write them. You need to be able to read them uh, in, in a manner that's proficient enough to say, well, this is nothing, or this might be something. And then you spend more time on, right? So I, I would go back to, this, to, to the fact saying, learn one language fairly well. Again, you don't have to be a, a professional programmer by any stretch of imagination, but learn it fairly well so you can actually code up an app with some Googling and, and practice with it. Try and make some project code stuff. It doesn't really matter what they do. Just try and code some stuff. Uh, once you've done that and you actually got somewhat proficient, it is so much easier to understand other languages. Um, obviously, it depends on how, how, how you learn and what kind of pain you want to encounter. Because starting out with something like C Sharp is fairly simple. So starting out with something like C is not that simple. Um, so it entirely depends on what you want. Um, but obviously, if you started with C, understand that everything is easy, right? Because you learned everything already. Starting out with a managed language like C Sharp or something, Going to the lower levels means learning more stuff. Um, that's not wrong, but it just means you need to learn some other stuff as well. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of people will really be able to understand that. You know, at, at the very least, like um, you know, on the job, they'll maybe they'll come across something, some nuanced situation where you know they'll realize, oh, well, maybe if I just write a quick script, I can kind of automate this attack. But um, there's another side to it too where um a lot of people are a little conflicted on where like binary exploitation fits in with the the skill sets of penetration testers and red teamers and uh, i'm i'm curious where you think um that skill set falls um do you think it's something that people should explore um do you think it's worth exploring what are what are your thoughts on it so i i think there's this multiple answers to this. Um, so, so the first one is, on a regular pen test, are you going to write a all-day exploit for an app and then attack that? No, you're not. That's, not, that's, that's unlikely to do for the majority of, of penetration testers. It's just this. Uh, of multiple reasons. First of all, you would have to have the time and availability of the app to actually locate the vulnerability and then create an exploit, which, unless you're very, very skilled at it, could take weeks. And I unlikely the, the, the client will pay for that. Um, we've had engagements that we've been that lucky, that we've, we've gone on an engagement, gone on a client, there was no way to privesk. Well, they had custom drivers, so we dumped the drivers, and, and, and I, we weren't specific on the pences, but the, the people who were dumped it, and they, they, they sent them to, to, to us, and then we reverse engineered them and find the bug, and two days later we had a, had an O-day for a kernel exploit, which gave a system on the box. 
So I'm not saying it can't happen, but it really does depend on the skill set. Uh, what I think is more important is, first of all, the concept of fixing exploits. That if, if you find some kind of vulnerability and you try to launch the exploit, or you can only find partly non-functional exploit, you can, if you have some knowledge in this, you can perhaps fix it. Even if you can get it working, you'll know enough to see whether is this actually exploitable or not. So you can, you can actually make a better report to the client saying, well, this is exploitable or this is not exploitable. And if I had more time, I could actually have exploited this. It's, that's, that's one thing. But I think the most important part of learning some exploit development is to understand uh, more about the underlying mechanisms of, of both applications, binary applications, but also the operating system. Uh, there is a lot of, of stuff going on in an operating system that we never see. But you as an attacker or as a defender, for that matter, uh, it, it gives valuable knowledge and it gives many attack opportunities. Um, so um, I've, I've had a, a, a when I worked at SOC, I had uh, alerts where like the alert came from a Windows uh, log saying there's a depth violation. What does that actually mean? Like, what does that actually mean? Well, it actually means that someone ran a program or an exploit that weren't did not work on the, the box because it actually crashed and because it, it triggered uh, the debt protection. So either there's an attacker who, who built an exploit that did, did not work, did not get a shell, uh, or the app was crap and it didn't work. Um, but does that mean we're safe, everything is good now? Well, if it's an attacker, then no, because he could just come back tomorrow with a functional exploit, an exploit, right? And then we wouldn't get any alerts. Um, so just knowing how, what, what these, it's a blue team, and knowing what these things actually mean, having some knowledge of binary exploitation is actually good for you. You might not need it every day, but it, it gives a very good foundation. Uh, on the offensive side, um, a, a lot of these, th th this, it, when you talk about vulnerabilities, uh, th there is the binary exploitation field, which typically looks at you have a, a, a server-side app or you have a browser. That's about it. That's essentially whatever you look at. Then you have web app, which obviously looks at web apps. And then you have AD, right? That's like the three main areas people often talk about. But there's a gray area between that. There's like services running. There's other stuff running. Like how would you know how this stuff works? Uh, so, so a good example is the, the potato series, right? That gives Privesk on, on services which came out with the, the hot potato and then I forget like bony potato and, and all the different potato stuffs and uh, juicy potato and which ended up and the, the, the um, I forget what the newest one is called and you have the, the print spoofer all these attacks um, the people who found them didn't just like invent them out of the blue they had to do research to figure out how, how different stuff worked and whether it did not it did work um, the skills required to do that kind of research are similar to the skills required to do binary exploitation. The, the, the tools, the techniques, the methodology you work at, those are very similar, which means you might not do binary exploitation per se, but you're applying the same, same type of mindset and skill set to do research to find these kind of vulnerabilities. So in that regard, to me, binary exploitation is an important field that is that gives lead way into other fields that aren't really, don't really have any other way into them. You know, I, um, I'm a little conflicted on it myself. There's, there have been, it's definitely an interest of mine, but you know, I've, I can't honestly say I've ever had, uh, like an opportunity to you know use that skill set, you know, both defensively or, you know, in my current role, it's, and I don't want to say that it's, it's not important to know. It's, it's just, I, I don't, I can't recall a, a time where I've ever had that opportunity, but, um, uh, it's, it's certainly one that interests me. You know, like, I, I, one of the very first bugs that I ever saw was a, a buffer overflow on the IO war game on smash the stack way back in the day. And that really, really, you know, sparked my interest in learning more about C learning more about different types of bug classes and uh I'd, I'd love to be able to take that skill set further it's just it, it seems like there's a very high bar for entry to it these days 
depends on what you want to go with it. Uh, if you want to go to the cutting edge, like we try to teach in ALD, then yes, you're completely right. There's a very high bar. There's a very long learning curve. Uh, but if you want to go to the, let's call it middle area, where you have enough knowledge so you know how many components of an OS actually works, and, and you could advise some programmers on, on, on like, you did this wrong. Like, the, essentially the equivalent to, to web app pen testing, where you say, well, this authentication mechanism was wrong. You shouldn't have uh, reused the tokens. You shouldn't have reused, you should have used predictable uh, IDs and stuff. The equivalent to that in, in expert development doesn't require that high of a level. Uh, and to be honest, that is sort of the area we we're going with on the EXP 301. Uh, so EXP 301 has received some criticism on launch, which I, I understand because I think a lot of people were hoping for AW online, which is not. It is a foundational expert development course. Uh, because to me, a senior pen tester should have some knowledge on how experts work, on some knowledge on how operating systems work. And, and one of the ways you really learn that is by doing some basic or foundational I'd rather call it here because I'm not going to say these the course is easy. That there are definitely some techniques in there which are going to be mind bending and tricky to understand. Um, but th that kind of skill set is for me is important if you want to be a, a senior <clears throat> a pen tester or consultant because you you should have that knowledge in your bag so you can advise uh, when, when you do um, do your tests and also you to write your reports and do meetings where you advise uh, the, the company on, on, on different app, the programmers and stuff. You should know these like in the wide area as well. It doesn't go deep in that manner because, as you just said, the bar of entry is, is much higher than that uh, compared to something like um, AD pen testing. The, the bar is not that high in that regard because if you know how to do constraint delegation, you know how to do constraint delegation. It doesn't get harder than that. That's just how it is. But if you know how to, well, that, that's you know how to do constraint delegation in 2015. You can still do it today. That doesn't really, there's not really any changes. But if you knew how to export a browse in 2015, you do not know how to export a browse in 2021. That's very different. Um, so, so in that regard, uh, export development field is is harder to keep up with. But in my opinion, a a, a senior uh, position um, consultant or whatever you want to call it should have the foundational knowledge that doesn't necessarily get outdated because it's foundational. You know, so there's, um, there's been a long history of, well, I wouldn't say a long history, but I mean, there's certainly been, you know, over the last 10 years, a very dramatic difference in how Microsoft has um, approached mitigations within, within Windows. Um, you know, like back in the day, you had the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit and over time, a lot of the features in Emmet were kind of rolled into Exploit Guard and Windows Defender. And you know, through some mitigations like Protected Free, as an example, entire bug classes were um, almost made in, almost made irrelevant. And when um, when we're trying to look at you know building up um, like those exploit development skill sets. Um, what are, what do you think are some bug classes that would be of interest to, um, like vulnerability researchers today to, to start exploring? I think that very much depends again on the attack surface. Uh, if we're talking about the cutting edge browser, if you're talking about Chrome, you're talking about, uh, edge, like these Firefox, these harder targets, uh, Adobe Reader, stuff like that. Then I agree, there's a lot of mitigations put in that makes it harder. But if you look at server-side apps, uh, especially the type of apps that run uh, on, on the, the interim, the backbone of networks, like um, first of all, router software, that's one thing, but also backup software, all these kind of big applications from, from big companies like IBM and um, HP, all these big, huge applications that does 17,000 things. They haven't got harder. Nothing has changed in those apps in the last 10 years. Nothing at all. They still have all the same type of bugs of um, uh, stack, stack overflows. Regular old stack overflows still there. They had former string vulnerabilities. 
um, they have heap overflows. Like they have use after freeze. And none of the mitigations put into Windows protect those because those mitigations were specifically built to work with uh, browsers and, and applications that use scripting languages. So as long as you at attack these other type of applications, nothing has changed in the last 10 years, essentially. Uh, I think the biggest change is if you put it on a newer server edition, put it on 2012 and above, you get dep automatically, which means you need to do rot. But other than that, nothing has really changed back from 2003 days. Um, so that, I think that that's that's probably one, one one way to look at it. That it's still all the still, old box is still very relevant. If you go and look on something like CDI, look for uh, published advisories, you'll find hundreds, if if like if almost not a thousand bucks every year in these server side applications, which are stack with overflows and and all the, these over, old uh, vulnerabilities, um, which still get addressed and they get fixed, but they're still there. Um, so that that is definitely one attack area. Uh, but if we go to the, the I guess what most people think about a sexy, uh, the, the browser exploit and stuff like that, then you're right. Um, a lot has changed uh, in the last five years. Um, I think the the bugs, the bug classes, uh, to say they're completely eradicated is not entirely true. It is correct. Like something I could use after free uh, was very prevalent back in 2016, 2017. Uh, they used they introduced the the, um, the deferred free and the protected heap and all these kind of things and they I'm not gonna say they died but they went down from being the prevalent class to be a minor class because you had you need to find a good bug that's not protected then you can exploit it uh, so they're still relevant you should still if you want to do research you want to find old age you want to do, um, do this field you still have to learn those bug classes not saying that they're completely irrelevant because they do still exist. And sometimes you find one that's good and you can actually use it. Uh, it wasn't that long ago Chrome had a use after free, right? So it still do exist and it's still exploitable in some instances. Uh, but there's no doubt the more um, hyped um, ones essentially are, especially type confusions, uh, because they are much more tricky to locate, but they're also more mind-bending to exploit. Uh, and, and it's something we go into a, in, in AWE because they're, they're definitely the more complicated bug class. Um, but overall, like you still have uh, heap overflows, uh, you, you still have a double freeze sometimes. So I'm not necessarily think that the bug class itself is, is the most interesting part to me. I think the most important, the most interesting part is uh, once you found a bug that is a good bug, good quality of a bug, how do you actually get code execution all the way to a shell? That is definitely where Microsoft has upped the game the most, I think. Um, I, honestly, I'm kind of sad that they went the Chromium way with Edge. Uh, personally, I think Microsoft Edge is an awful browser. I would never use it to do anything because it, it's very bad and very slow. So in that regard, the business regard, I do get why they went Chromium. But from expert development side, I loved Edge. Edge had every single mitigation you could ever dream of inside that app. When they went to Chromium, they kind of get bound to, to Chrome and, and, and their mitigation. They don't have even half the mitigation that, that the old Edge has. Uh, so, so if you want the, like a very, very difficult target, exploit development rights to actually go from bug to shell, go for Edge. That's, that's awesome. There's like over 30 mitigations in there you're going to hit and you have to bypass. Uh, so it, it's really intense to, to work something like that, whereas something like Chrome only has like 10. Uh, so it, it, it's it's... It's much more interesting from from an academic perspective, if you will, to actually learn how to do the things. Because if you can do Edge, you can definitely Chrome. Like Chrome is an easy. Um, so, so in that regard, I, I think I don't necessarily think the, the bug classes themselves are the most important part to look at, but it's more a matter of the uh, the the exploitation uh, uh, ways of doing exploitation that you need to keep up with all the new mitigations they put out. Um, I think a good example also here is something like uh, null pointed dereferences in kernel exploits. Uh, that that used to be a very big thing uh, back on Windows 7. It was awesome, like null pointed dereferences all the time, and you could do kernel exploits. Um, go to Windows 8, they they essentially mitigated that bug class died. It's completely dead. Except last year, two um, null pointed dereferences bugs came out that were exploitable because of specific conditions. But you would only know that if you actually learned about null pointed reference, how they used to work. Then you could adapt these and, and, and understand these special conditions, right? 
So there's no doubt the person who found these two bugs and actually reported them and knew they were exploitable and, and could prove that to Microsoft. Well, he knew how to do them the old way. So that's go, kind of goes back to, to understanding the foundations. You need to understand the basics, the foundations, the old stuff to be able to understand the new stuff and get it into context and perspective. Would, um, would you also say that knowing how to kind of chain and intertwine multiple different types of vulnerabilities in, into, into one would be a good skill to develop? Because that's like with, um, with web exploitation for me, um, you know, like uh, with cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery, uh, you, you can really build something amazing when, mm -hmm. when you can combine those type of bugs. Do you, do you think um, that's an that's equally important concept to, for vulnerability researchers to start exploring? It's it's most of the time it is required, right? Uh, today, a browser exploit uh, for for a, an up to date browser typically requires two or three bugs at least, sometimes more, uh, because you need to, typically you need to get um, you need to get control the instruction pointer somehow. But often to do that, you need to bypass ASLR. Sometimes that's possible in the same bug. Sometimes it's not. So sometimes you actually need two. Um, then you need to bypass some of the mitigation. Sometimes you can do that inherently. Sometimes you cannot. Uh, but especially, almost every browser today has a sandbox. So you need a sandbox escape as well, which is going to require vulnerability. So, so most browser exploits today, somewhere between two, three bucks, perhaps up to five, six bucks is, are required uh, to actually get that. So you're right. There's definitely stuff hurts about uh, chaining these together. But it's also about chaining all the mitigation bypasses together, right? You just talked about uh, cross-site script forgery and stuff. That is essentially two two mitigations, right? If you will, that you have to bypass find bugs for. In in binary expectation, we're talking about thirty of those. You have to chain together and bypass all of them at once uh, in, in different ways. So in, in that way, the skill is definitely important. But it isn't necessarily the bugs themselves. It's more about about the techniques of bypassing them, and, and sometimes. Uh, two techniques of, of bypassing a vulnerability doesn't go together in that specific instance. So you need to, to tweak them. You need to come up with a third way of doing it, um, which again goes back to knowing the basics and the context and all that kind of stuff to be able to do this. Now, for when you are looking for zero days, um, where does your research process start? Um, what are some indicators that you look for when you feel like you're onto a bug and how, how are you able to differentiate that from when you might be on a rabbit hole? Uh, yeah, so when I started out, I, I obviously tried to look for old days. Like, I guess everyone else finds, it's cool to look for old days, find old days. And, and I, I did with some web app pen tests where obviously you, you, I found some stuff, um, but I also uh, did some very, I essentially taught myself reverse engineering of, of, of binary apps to try and find some ODs and those. And uh, I, I found trying to do fussing is not easy. Fussing requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of pre-work. So if you're talking about a server-side app uh, and the code base isn't ginormous, oftentimes it's actually easier just to reverse engineer it and try to fuss it, in, in my opinion at least, as soon as you, you kind of learn the basics. Um, the majority of my research on the last five years or so haven't really been looking for O days per se, uh, because it, it, it's cool to find an O day. So, so for like an expectation perspective, it's cool to find an O day. Then they report it, and two months later, it's fixed. At least if you're lucky, right? That's it. It's done. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, I, I, I prefer and I love to find expectation techniques or bypasses of mitigations, because those are not vulnerabilities per se. Um, like if you take my example with, with the stuff I presented at Black Hand Def Con back in 2017. Um, those techniques were not ODAs. Um, I had some stuff reported to Microsoft, uh, not, not those specifically, but some other stuff reported to Microsoft, which essentially came back and said, well, this is not, this is not a vulnerability. This is not part of our mitigation program, so we don't cover this. Uh, and you typically see those kind of stuff that Microsoft don't patch it. They'll say, we consider this for the next update version. That's about it. So some of these stuff might live for six months, perhaps several years. So my perspective, there's more return on investment to finding an, a, a bypass technique, at least personally for me, to find a bypass technique that will work for six months to two years or something, than finding a, an O-Day bug that will work for two weeks before it's patched, or two months before it's patched. So to me, that's more fun. Um, regards to the, the rabbit hole part, uh, 
obviously everyone gets into a rabbit hole sometimes, but I, I think the more you learn about an area, it easier it is to see, to know what you have to look for um, and, and to keep up to date w- with that. So I definitely had a long period of time where I had to learn what I know today. But when you get to the level where you essentially are at the, the front end, the, the, not necessarily the cutting edge, but you, you know most of the stuff at least. When something changes, it's a lot easier to understand what, what was the change. How could this change be, be a bad thing? How could this change be something you could exploit? Uh, so instead of having to spend three weeks understanding how the tech technique could work, you only have to perhaps spend two days on it because it's only the difference you have to understand, not the entire thing. Um, so when I did the, the research for, um, for Black Hat, essentially I was just looking at whatever they did in inside a release. I was looking at whether my technique worked. And if it didn't work, well, I found out what the change and I could update my technique. Um, that's essentially what I did. Uh, also, when I came out with the, the, the we did a blog post back in uh, in 2019 uh, on, on current ASR bypass. That was the same thing. They they made a patch which essentially broke some of the old techniques. Well, I just looked how did they implement that change, which automatically gave me a new bypass because that was a new design flaw. Um, so so keeping like keeping current, keeping up, that is to me the easiest way of not falling for rabbit holes because you only have to look at the differences. If you want to pick up kernel exploitation and do find old days, not going to rabbit holes is probably going to be impossible. You're going to you're going to get trapped sometimes because you have to learn so much stuff. You have to you learn you have to learn the entire breadth of it. But once you get there, it's a lot easier not to fall for them. But you have to get there, and and, and just like everything else, you're gonna fall for the ten thousand hour rule, right? You're not gonna pick up a guitar and learn to be very good at guitar and play that at a, at a concert in 50 hours just because you watched a YouTube video about it, right? That's not going to happen. You have to spend the hours on it. You have to spend the years learning it. This is exactly the same thing. You have to spend the time. There are some shortcuts. You, you can learn everything on your own because as many people say, everything is online. You can Google it. You can find it. That's completely true. Then it's probably going to take you somewhere between five to 10 years to learn it. Or you, you can take training material combined with your own research. Then perhaps you can half that time to learn, right? That, that's kind of the trade-off. You, stuff like Pen 300, it, it's completely correct. Like 50% of the material, it, you can find that online on, on Google and, and different YouTube videos and whatnot. Um, th- th- that's not the point. The point is that would take you perhaps years to go through, to go through that and, and determine whether something is crap or not, whether it works or doesn't work anymore. Uh, what you can get from a course, I'm not only talking our course, but obviously also our other courses, uh, is you have the content creator already made those decisions, well, not decisions, but made those analysis of whether a technique works or does not work anymore and, and how it works and, and, and tries to incorporate that in, in a narrative that makes sense instead of just incoherent pieces and pieces uh, you, you have to, to pick up. Um, so, so I think it, it, to get to that cutting edge, you have to put in the time, but you, you can speed it up a bit by taking different trainings, by taking different concepts, perhaps by being mentored if you're lucky enough to find someone who will mentor you. Uh, those are shortcuts, but there's no way you're going to pick up expert development tomorrow and then be cutting edge in a year. That's not just that's not going to happen, right? Not At least not for 90% of, or 95% of people. Um, obviously, there's going to be a few outliers here and there, but for the majority of people, no. You're going to have to spend multiple years to get there. Um, to, to actually be good at it. And that applies essentially to web app, that applies to, to AD pen testing, any other field, right? You're not going to start out from college, uh, start in college and, and pick up hacking and then be a senior consultant at Mandy in, in two years. Not unless you're very lucky and very, very skilled, right? Most people have to spend at least five years to get there. And, you know, I was just going to say, um, I, I think a lot of newer people will be able to relate to that pretty well because... You know, like looking back to when I was, um, you know, much, much newer to to all of the the what the field entails. Um, you know, like before going into um, PWB, you know, I knew a couple of of web attacks, and you know, I was I knew that buffer overflows were a thing, but you know, until I had taken that course, it had never even occurred to me that privilege escalation was a thing. You know, like there was just a a supreme amount of ignorance on on my behalf and uh, i think i think 
people when when they hear from from people like you that there's you know there there's more to this you know little particular area than what you might already know and be, like going through paid training is a a good way to kind of jumpstart yourself in in a good direction because like that's like the biggest problem right it's you don't know what you don't know but it's it's completely true it's completely true. You, you have to you have to open your eyes in some manner and the counter argument is yes you can just google it everything is online that's not completely true but yes most stuff is online but the time requirement to go through that uh, is very high and so where do you start right what's easy to pick up what's not easy to pick up how do you go through what walks through is good what walks through is not good um that could take you like that, that could increase the time amount you need by so much and you could get frustrated and you could essentially quit on that because it's not worth my time to do that whereas if you do some guided approach uh, again it doesn't necessarily have to be pay training it could also be a mentor it could be a, if you work in a company that has senior people they mentor you whatever that could really speed it up by, by essentially being told where to look and how to look at it uh, and be guided in that manner uh, so I, I think that 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 part is important for for new people as well to, to try and either jumpstart it or, or essentially um, ha have a mentor or some some sort of that to to, to help guide. Now for um, for those a little more advanced, we uh, we actually have a community submitted question for you. Um, <laughs> This one comes from Connor McGar. Shout out to Eeyore on Twitter. Um, Connor S. For someone who is wanting to get into browser exploitation on Windows, what are some good resources to get started? And that, that's tricky, right? Because that is that is one of the areas where you're not going to find that many resources online. Um, and, and the stuff you find is going to be multiple years old, which means it's not going to be current anymore. Um, that, that is a field that moves very quickly. So I, I will say, um, I remember there was a, a stark change back in somewhere between 2010, 2012. Browser exploitation really changed back then. Um, perhaps a bit later, even perhaps about like 13 or something. Uh, that, that was around the time where ASLR became commonplace in a browser. Before that, essentially, you, you could find uh, an, a DLL that didn't have ASLR which means it was kind of easy to do up. Um, then you, you had to find an info leak. And I remember when that came out, uh, or, well, that, that concept essentially started. And honestly, I think at that time, there were perhaps like five people in the world who knew how to do it. And I was not among them. I, I, I quickly said that I was definitely not among one of those five people. I was still like learning at that point in time. Uh, and I remember some of the first blog posts that came out uh, about it. And I read those and they, they seemed like complete magic. Uh, until I spent like six months on them, uh, tried to work out how they did it. And, and like some years went past, and then an info, info leak now is, is essentially commonplace uh, in a browser exploit. Um, the same thing applies again and again with different mitigations. <clears throat> so, so finding good resources for that, 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 is, that is tricky uh, because you kind of have to go back to those kind of stuff and pick it up. Um, I'm honestly not aware of, of, of any magic resource uh, just to go go look. Uh, what I did uh, back then was essentially scour every single browser exploit I could find that had some sort of, of explanation on it and work through those. And back in that time, that was like five or something. Uh, that, that was it, right? Essentially, that had any kind of explanation of what how they worked and worked through those. Um, and then from there, I kind of started to, to learn on my own. Um, I'm pretty confident now there are a lot more, uh, but I ha honestly haven't really looked uh, because that, that was the point I was at that time, right? I need those resources. So I, I, I don't keep a list of resources on, on what to look for um, because I haven't needed it since, honestly. Um, but I, that would be my approach for browser exploitation. That, that would be to, to go and look for write-ups on different exploits and try to work through those. Uh, I am not aware of any public free resources that actually deal with browser exploitation in a comprehensive way. Um, probably because, first of all, not that many people know how to do it. So those people who do probably not going to do it for free. 
Uh, also because the work effort to put into that is, is quite large, which means, again, they're not going to do it for free because it will be a full-time job, which they need to have to actually pay their bills. So they don't have time for that necessarily. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure whether I, I can just point at the magic bullet here other than try to look for different exploits with explanations and essentially try to understand them. Uh, but you have to going to put in the hours. That or we're back to most likely some of the paid trainings. Uh, the, the few ones that actually have uh, browser exploitations in them. Uh, again, because if you want to pro provide a coherent message on how this works and, and all the details, all the steps, it, it, it takes weeks to prepare that kind of material. Uh, so and you have to keep it updated, right? Because as I said, this field updates so quickly. So a, a browser exploit today uh, is unlikely to work. Well, obviously the bug will be patched, but the exploitation technique is unlikely to work in two years. It, it will require either modification or a brand new technique, which means again, it's unlikely to find a lot of resources that people put out for free because they have to spend so much time making it that they don't have that kind of free time. They would have to charge money for it to actually find the time to do it as their day job, right? Which essentially is what we also do with AWE. We have, like, we put our research into that and we, we teach it there. But there's no way we can provide AWE free or the research from that for free because we have to spend so much time that obviously the office has to pay me the salary for. Uh, so, so that's not really any easy way here, uh, I, I think, sadly. That's a bummer. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious um, what your thoughts on, um, you know, like uh, Google's Project Zero, um, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll do like really big disclosures and do a lot of write-ups. Do you think that would be... You know, maybe it, if there are any free resources, do you do you feel like that one might be a good one? Yeah. So, so I think um, f first of all, I, I really love the, the project. Uh, from 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 the, the, the standpoint of learning, it, it's a great part project because they do some write ups sometimes, but it, that's not the, to me that's not the valuable part. The valuable part is they have procs, they have proof of concepts. They might be proof of concept with three lines of explanations, but that's enough. Essentially, you have the park, right? The difference between that is you find the CVE. It says there's an there's a, a heap overflow. If you're lucky, there's a heap overflow um, bug in uh, in Internet Explorer, right? Go from there. That's that's like that doesn't really provide any value at all to, to find it, right? Whereas they have the puck. so you can actually pick up the puck. Uh, you can put that in a VM, see crashes. That's your starting point, right? Uh, so, so in that regard, that is a valuable resource uh, and and. Uh, for something like AWE, and we, we, when I do my own research, uh, we, we sometimes turn to that and pick up some of those pucks, uh, to as a case study, um, because it, 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 they have so many, so it, you can pick and choose and find one that's actually educational, that, that fits different variations and, and teaches it what you want to teach. Uh, Towards to find your own old age, because then you have to spend a lot of time on the old age. And again, back to my idea that Finding an ODA and teaching that is not necessarily the, the important part because that bug is going to be patched in two months. That's it. It doesn't work anymore anyway. The important part is how do you use it? And, and then it doesn't really matter whether we talk about it one day or an ODA because it's still the same concept of how to use it. Uh, and still, as long as it's not like five years old because then it might not work anymore, that exploit technique. Um, but my suggestion is also essentially what I did is I, I looked for these write-up that had the full write-up. And then whenever I do, do new research and want to find something else, uh, I, I go often go on Google, Google Project Zero, uh, download a POC, and go from the POC with the techniques I saw in the other write-ups and see if I can replicate. If it doesn't work, then I figure out why doesn't it work and what can, how can I perhaps modify this. Um, so, so in that regard, I think it's a very valuable resource, yes. Um, in that regard, CDI can also be found out valuable. Again, for browser exploits, not really, because they essentially just say there's a heap overflow in Explorer. That's it, right? Or in Edge or Chrome, which is kind of worthless. But for browse, uh, sorry, for kernel exploits, it is actually sometimes uh, interesting, because for third-party drivers, they typically get give like the I/O control code and the driver name. So if you know some version engineering, that's essentially you already have it, right? You could build the pod like in half an hour uh, or an hour or whatever. Uh, whereas in, in other um, in native drivers, it typically mentions the function name and the driver, right? 
So, so you can again, you can do reverse engineering and find it within a couple of hours if you're lucky. So sometimes it's a couple of hours, sometimes it's two weeks. I've had that as well. Uh, but that's kind of a starting point again to, to find and, and pick up a one day and actually make that into an exploit, uh, which in my opinion is the next step. After you, you did some, some, some walkthroughs, that's probably the next step. That's to work on the one days, right? Once you, you got that work, if you want to go really further, then sure, you could try and find an O day. But exploiting a one day and finding an O day uh, is not necessarily the same thing because we can talk about how to exploit it, not how to find it. And how to find a browser exploit? I'm not sure you're going to find that many free resources on that that work because when people give up presentation, the conference on how to fuss browsers, it's because they already did it, right? They already built a browser framework. They already had it running for six months to a year and found 100 bucks, which is submitted and got money for. Then they released a framework because now it's run dry or perhaps one or two left, and that's it, right? So that's a, it's a, honestly, in my opinion, that's an even harder field to get into because you have to pick up these, these um, fuzzing frameworks and ideas and essentially figure out what didn't they do. So I do that instead because if you do the same thing, well, you're not going to find anything on a new version because they all been patched, right? Uh, so you need to figure out what to do instead, uh, which requires you to know how a browser works and learning. Like you have to know, uh, for most browsers, obviously it's JavaScript. So you need to know a bunch about how JavaScript works and how objects work in JavaScript because obviously you don't know what to fuss. Uh, so, so, so fussing itself is, is an even, even in my opinion, is, is fussing is a, is a complete standalone skill set you need to develop almost from scratch, uh, which obviously requires some knowledge in expert development. And, but essentially it also requires a lot of knowledge in reverse engineering because you can't just pick up, I'm going to say, I'm going to fuss Chrome. That'd be right if write a fuzzer for Chrome, right? No, like you have to know what to attack in Chrome, right? What's actually valuable? What's what what's what? Where would attack even work in Chrome? And, and oftentimes, when you have a crash, well, you can just submit that and get money, right? You would have to actually figure out whether this is exploitable or not, which means you have to work with it a bit to see whether this is like a, a, a done on service or something else, or it's like nothing at all, essentially. It is a, it's a false positive or something like that. That requires some engineering skills, but also like for development skills. What um what challenges do you see coming to the field in in the near future, or even the long term future? Well, this I guess there's two sides of this, right? In, in one perspective, I don't see any real challenges in this field, as long as as humans are making software and using software. Uh, and it uses the very, very broad terms, right? There's going to be vulnerabilities, and they're going to be exploitable. That's just how it is, because humans are stupid. In, in, like, pe well, no, sorry, humans are intelligent, but people are stupid. Uh, you, you put enough humans together, and you'll find stupid people in there, right? And they do <laughs> stupid stuff. But just that's the fact of life, right? That's just right. how it is. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's still going to be avenues of attack. That's that's for sure. Um. The, so if you look at more more like specific i i think uh what, what i think is going to be the most challenging and most interesting thing is to see where microsoft takes it uh, because at this point in time microsoft are kind of driving a lot of stuff and so many people use their products so it, it, it's very prevalent um and depending on what they do over the next couple of years that's going to be even more interesting to see what kind of attacks are even possible which ones will die out or be very complex to perform um I, I don't. I don't think the, the pace of, of learning new material will, will decrease. Uh, probably on the other hand, it'll probably accelerate even more, become even harder to reach the cutting edge. Uh, which is probably got the biggest challenge is, is do you need to keep learning all the time. And I'm assuming here, as you grow older, at some point that gets not fun anymore, right? Yeah. It, it's fun for a while, but at some point when you get older and you get other priorities, it not might, might be as fun anymore. Um, but uh, I, I would think um, when stuff, when people stuff like talk about, well, they're gonna have AI, it's gonna put us out of business. No, I, I honestly don't believe that. It, it might change some techniques, it might make some things a bit harder, but no. Fundamentally, over the last three, four years in like pen testing or even in red team for that matter, I don't really see a, a huge improvement. It's essentially the same thing, right? It's still the same kind of stuff people, organizations do wrong. It's still the same kind of 
they, they buy fancy products, but they don't really use them or they don't use them correctly. And that's not necessarily the product's fault. That's essentially the people problem, right? That it, you, you, you tick a box because now you're compliant. That's all they care about because that's what you have to do to not get a penalty or pay a fine. But real security doesn't really matter except you get compromised. If you get compromised, you might get out of business anyway. So who cares? Um, so I, fundamentally, I don't think on, on the broader strokes, anything will change over the next couple of years or even perhaps five years. Uh, on the, 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 the targeted approach, if you will, some fields will definitely get harder. Some things will, will get, definitely get a bit trickier and perhaps have less people in them. Uh, some bug classes might not be as, as broadly exploitable uh, across all fields. But again, if you send a work document or some other kind of attachment and fool a user into clicking it because you, you were lucky to get a user that was you, you could fool, um, you're still inside the network, right? The network still has to function. The user still has to be able to do his daily job. As long as you can act in that context, you can compromise a bunch of stuff. That's not going to change anytime soon, um, because if, if you change that, then you, you're going to reduce the, um, the efficiency of that employee, which means the company is going to lose money on, on like again, if they reduce efficiency of every employee, they're going to use they're going to reduce their efficiency, which means they're going to reduce their profitability, which they don't want. Um, so I, I honestly don't see this. A, 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 I don't see any negative sides on this. I don't see any. Huge things. Obviously, ten years from now, I don't think anyone can predict how this field looks because no one could have predicted ten years ago how it looks today. Um, but I don't think we're gonna get over the people problem anytime soon, which obviously is good for us. It's a, it's a business perspective, right? That, that we still have something to do. Um, the, the fields might narrow. The new fields might open. I, I don't see something like export development becoming a huge field all of a sudden. It probably get a bit smaller than it is today. Uh, whereas something like Active Directory and like the um, the phishing part, uh, perhaps also the actual red teaming part, is going to get even bigger because more people might get some kind of logging, some kind of automated logging that does stuff. Uh, so that would be more important. But no, I, I, I don't see any real change over the next two, three, four, five years, honestly. And um, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, on the other hand, I also think AI is quite unpredictable you know it's still in its infancy and i'm very curious to see what comes of it but i don't want to draw any conclusions either so um i don't disagree on the the, the notion that ai has a lot of opportunities but it, it it hinges on whether the humans that buy that ai product and installs it first of all it buys a product that that's that is meaningful for their organization they install it correctly and then subsequently actually use it correctly and don't just like I, I've worked at different organizations. I've, I've done consultancy at different organizations that had EDRs and other network analysis and ED, uh, IPSs and seams and whatnot. And they spend millions on it. But at the end, no one looked at the logs. Right? It, it, it probably found a bunch of stuff, but they looked at the logs every year when it ran full on the, uh, the hard drive and they deleted them. Right. As long as organizations keep doing that sort of thing, it doesn't matter how good the product is. They're still using it wrong. They could find every single attack, but it doesn't really matter. That's very true. Um, so kind of bringing this toward a close, what do you hope to achieve or what do you hope to change um, going into 2021? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, Obviously, I, I probably have some, some personal goals. I, I want to do some some more research and, and stuff. But I guess what what I what I did over the last year, uh, and I hope to do is, is I started becoming more uh, involved in the community, uh, which I, I I hope to continue this year. Uh, and my main driver for that is essentially to try and first of all give back a bit of what I've been lucky enough to learn, but not necessarily. The, the technical perspective and more, more about the mindset and the way to approach stuff. Because to me, that's, that's the most important part. If you're not, if you're never going to essentially try harder or, or learn on your own and be, be, be willing to, to learn and keep learning, then it doesn't matter whether you understand the latest type of attack because th then you're not going to make it anyway. Right. 
you have you have to you have to learn the mentality. If you learn the mentality, then essentially I'm not going to say it becomes easy, but then it becomes natural to learn stuff. Um, so that that's definitely something I, I want to try and work with people on. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, one way is to do it is with the community. Another way is to do it at offsec in the products we deliver uh, to try and and try and reach uh, more of the younger, newer base uh, of, of of students and, and people in infosec and try to teach them this approach in a way they they can catch on to it, uh, which obviously I, I agree, I completely agree, is different than it was when I learned it 10 years ago or even five years ago. Uh, the, the market has broadened, which means more people have come into it, but also younger people. And, and, and expectations and way we learn are different today than were 10 years ago. Uh, so that's definitely something I, I, would, I want to work on uh, this year to try and, and help both in community, but also in our products. Uh, not not saying that we will see result of that in this year, but it, it, it's it's um, part part of the 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 responsibility I try to to impose on products we develop um, on on how we teach, not necessarily what we teach exactly because that's that's still the less important part, but how we teach and how we drive the mentality. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Uh, I'm super excited to you know continue my own personal growth through what you and the others at offensive security are doing. I'm, I'm super excited to see what's next from you guys. I'm, I totally am. Um, but, uh, for Morton, what's next for you? Do you, do you have any speaking engagements or any cool projects that the community might be interested in? Speaking, speaking wise, no, because, well, first of all, we still have Corona, right? Uh, and, and honestly, to me, speaking virtually at a conference is just not the same thing. It just isn't. Uh, you don't have the engagement. You don't. It's not the same to me, honestly. Uh, but but the other part, to speak, you need to do research, right? You need to have some research to present. Um, and I'll be frank, I haven't done that much research over the last couple of years uh, because, as you know, I've written two courses for Offsec, right? That that has taken up the majority of the time because writing a course is it takes a long time because it's not just writing a course, but it's also building VMs, right? Um, as, as you might have seen in, in the Pen 300, uh, when, when people talk about it as well, those labs are not, they're quite extensive, right? Uh, they're almost the same size as PWK. Uh, that, that, that takes months to build and test. Um, so I have been a lot of time on essentially my job, uh, which obviously makes sense, but that doesn't mean I didn't have a lot of time to research because I do have a family. I have, I have a kid and everything. So, right, that, that's a priority as well for me. Uh, but now that uh, Pen 300 is released and we will have um, EXP 301, uh, the first students will pick that up on, on the 7th of March. Um, hopefully, I get some more time at, at work to actually do research for upcoming projects. Uh, so I, I would hope uh, to, to be able to do some fun research there. Uh, and some of that I, I, I do want to share, uh, not just put into a course you have to pay, pay for and put behind a paywall, but I do also want to, to show off some of the byproducts, some of the stuff. Um, and, and some of the stuff I see is, is basically is misconceptions people have about specific topics um, that, that tr try to, to set, essentially set the record straight on, on different subjects where I think it makes sense from a research perspective. Um, so, so without going into any details here, because I can't, <laughs> um, I, I, I do have an interest in, in, in doing some research this year and, and presenting some of it. It might not be a conference. It might just be a blog post or something instead. But but I, I do have an interest in, in putting out some content that isn't just behind a paywall. I will be very, very excited to see what comes out. I'm a... Uh... Future's looking bright. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, me too. So um, where can people reach out to you? Uh, what's, a, what's a good link for if people want to... I don't know, pester you, troll you, ask you questions. Uh, well, I guess the, the, the I, I still have my Twitter. Uh, honestly, I'm not that active on Twitter again because I haven't actually done a lot of research lately. So I, I still look at that. So obviously you, you can try to reach out there. But on, other than that, I think the Discord is probably the, the best way to reach me. Um, I, I, I monitor that. It's not, it's in principle, it's not part of my job uh, to do that because I'm not a community manager. But Part of my job is obviously to improve our, our content, which means picking up feedback from students. 
so I, I monitor uh, Discord quite a bit, uh, more or less on a daily basis. Um, so so that, that is one way to reach me. Uh, do keep in mind, I, I as I've gotten older, I also try to keep work and private life somewhat separate. So don't expect me to reply back in five minutes if you if you're reaching out to me while I'm making dinner or something, because then I'm on family time. Uh, but you, you can definitely reach out, and then I'll I'll come back to you when when I have the time. Yes, absolutely. And I, like I said, once again, I'm super grateful that you were able to do this with me. And, um, you know, I hope people can take some of your knowledge and your experiences and build upon their careers and their their knowledge base and, you know, figure out what they need to do to you know, to really push the mold with, with what they're learning and where their career is going. So once again, Morton, thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever reacted to Morton in the Discord by spamming the I emoji, go ahead and hit those like and subscribe buttons. Check Morton out on Twitter at Blobster81, and uh, we will catch you all in the next one.